subject I'm supposed to talk about, namely what is beauty and why do we need it, is a subject which I, I felt I had completely covered in the little film I did for the BBC ten or, or, or more years ago, oh, no, ten years ago it was, uh, in which uh, caused so much opprobrium uh, to be directed towards me that I thought I'd leave that subject for the time being and get on with other things. So but now I've come back to it, uh, and I should say that um, I, I think many of you in this room would have come across the little book that I read, wrote on the topic of beauty, this short introduction, which was as short as I could make it, but it's still 120 pages or so. And now I have to do the same thing uh, in a brief talk. So it will be somewhat disorganized. Um, just on, on one point... The, um, <clears throat> the journey from Oxford to Cambridge, um, it is an interesting one. Uh, it used to be actually very easy because there was a train service uh, which consisted purely in, a, in those two stations linked across the centre of, uh, of England. And we as undergraduates always used to do it. That train service was cancelled um, with the rise of the the motor car and all the other um, conveniences of the modern world. It was assumed that you would drive there or your parents would drive you there or, or, or you would pass by London and never get there anyway. <laughs> uh, um, and uh, now the journey involves passing through the town of Milton Keynes, built according to American specifications by an American planner in response to a socialist government in Britain. Uh, and Milton Keynes, therefore, uh, stretches for the entire region between uh, Oxford and Cambridge uh, and is impassable. Uh, a few people lie scattered around the, the, the bypasses, and that's, uh, but it, it is essentially it's an obstacle which illustrates many of the things that I wanted to say this evening, which is the triumph of ugliness in the world in, in which we live. Uh, and why has it happened, and how can we resist it and why should we resist it? Uh, there is a, a myth. I'm going to talk philosophically for a bit. Um, uh, and I think it's important to, to get some of the philosophy right. But there's a myth that, that judgments about beauty are all subjective. It's a, it's a pure matter of taste, which it is. But that taste is not something which has any objective foundation. Uh, and people swallow this. Uh, um, because it's a very convenient thing to swallow. Everybody feels, if they encounter someone who disagrees with their taste, they feel threatened by this. And therefore, the easiest way out is to say that there is no objective judgment about beauty. You think you're th what you think, I think what I think. Uh, and therefore, let's just agree to differ uh, and move on to a more pleasant conversation with someone else. Uh, and I, I think this is something which has had a very corrosive effect on, on public life. Because, in fact, uh, beauty does matter to us uh, in, uh, in everything that we do. We flee from ugly, ugliness, and we argue constantly with others as to what is the correct way, for instance, of furnishing a room, laying a table, dressing for dinner, whatever it is that, that, that is the question at the moment. We argue over this, and um, there is a consensus that emerges over a wide range of cases. Everybody coming into this club will say, what a beautiful place this is, uh, especially in uh, having come in from the, uh, what is lying all around it. Uh, and, um, <laughs> and uh, you know, the, the, it's not just Americans that feel this, although you have a... Uh, uh, you know, a, a special apprenticeship in ugliness which, <laughs> which prepares you for it. Nevertheless, once you've entered it, you recognize that you are, it, it, you've met what you really wanted. You might not have known that this is what you wanted, but when you're here, you know it. Um, so there's a, a, a consensus that emerges very spontaneously among people. And if you look around at the the landscapes and cities that people visit. What, where do they go on their holidays, for instance? 
Um, they don't visit places necessarily for their amenities. Some people do. Some people go because it's a nice beach to lie in the sun or, 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 or something like that. Um, but most people visit places, especially if they're far distant places, not for their amenities, but, but for their lack of them. Uh, you know, Detroit has an awful lot of amenities, but d- d- has it ever had a tourist? <laughs> uh, um, but Venice has no amenities whatsoever, but is absolutely saturated with tourists. They go there not um, for the beaches or the, uh, or, the, or, or the food or anything else. They go there for Venice because it is beautiful. So if, if beauty has that power to draw us to it, they suggest that there's more to beauty than simply fleeting sensations. It's not a matter of taste in the way that your taste in ice cream is a matter of taste. It has something more profoundly connected to the human condition as such. Something in us calls for beauty and is fulfilled by it. I think that's the thought that I'd like to put into your heads this evening. It matters in something like the way that kindness and affection matter. We flee from places where we don't find kindness. Um, and I want you to think of what the word kindness, the etymology of that word, it comes from a sense that we belong to a certain kind, that, that the human kind. Kindness is our way of, uh, of expressing that to each other, of recognizing in the other that he, he or she is the same kind of thing as I am. And I think, therefore, we always flee from unkindness and we flee from ugliness in the same way. It's the same basic motive that that certain things in our environment are unkind to us, even though they are mere objects. Uh, And uh, our pleasure in beauty and our uh, uh, displeasure in ugliness are not like our pleasure in strawberry ice cream and our displeasure in a a cup of gall, they are partly intellectual things. They're not sensations. These are pleasures which have an object. And pleasures with an object can can be mistaken. The pleasure that you take in seeing your your child win the long jump at school, that's a fantastic pleasure which fills your whole being because you know, there's a story attached to it. You're attached to it. But suppose you discover that that child who's won the long jump, who looked exactly like your son, actually is somebody else. Immediately, your pleasure has gone. You made a mistake. Uh, so, uh, and a pleasure that can actually be a mistake must therefore be an intellectual pleasure that involves a judgment of the world and attempt to assess it. And that's... And, and pleasures of... Uh, uh, of, uh, in beautiful things are like that. They can be founded on mistakes. And this is a, 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 an extremely interesting issue for me as a philosopher. Uh, what other pleasures involve mistake, can involve mistakes? You know, there's no mistake involved in, in, in enjoying strawberry ice cream. There might be a mistake in thinking that, that enjoyment is important. But, you know, that's a different thing. But think of sexual pleasures. I, I'm looking around this room and I recognize that probably not many people do. But, um, <laughs> but suppose you did. Uh, there are sexual pleasures which could involve a mistake. You know, it was, you thought it was your husband who came in uh, 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 to embrace you, and it wasn't. It was that bastard that had been persecuting you in the bar. Uh, um, and, you know, etc. So we know there's all sorts of complicated matters like that where, where mistakes can enter. Uh, an assessment of the situation is part of the pleasure. And I think this is very important to us when thinking about beauty, that, that, that our judgments of beauty, although they might be spontaneous at first, they become educated. They adapt themselves to our knowledge uh, and uh, they become kind of affirmations of our vision of the world. Now, in this area, <coughs> definitions elude us. Um, it, as in all important ideas, the definition uh, is almost impossible to, to come up with. Uh, 
The same with the idea of goodness. You know, who has ever produced an effective idea, uh, definition of the good or a, a definition of truth? You just imagine, and, uh, uh, you know, there are philosophers who think about how you would define truth, and it always r- goes round and round in a circle. You know, truth means correspondence to the facts. What are facts? Well, they're, they're truths, you know, uh, etc. Et and the same with, with goodness and beauty, that, that uh, ev- we're not going to solve the question why we're interested in these things by producing definitions. They will simply be reiterations of the problem. But some crucial points can be made, I think, that help to explain why beauty is important to us. And that's what I shall just talk about for a short while. I assume that, that I should be allowing people to ask questions as well before we, before we conclude. And, and until, I mean, this is a very important question for a, a speaker. Until I've heard what your questions are, I don't actually know what to say to you. So I will try and uh, leave some room for questions anyway. But the first thing that I think everybody who's thought about this recognizes to be true is that beauty is not a means to an end but an end in itself Uh, even if beauty is sometimes a means to something else it's only a means to another thing because it's also an end in itself a beautiful the purpose of a beautiful beautiful object is that it is Uh, and this is true of literature uh, 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 (coughs) and uh, and music and all the other art forms Uh, and um, even in narrative literature where there's there's a story to be extracted we distinguish the telling of the story from its presentation and it's the presentation that matters how it comes before your consciousness in the experience of it rather than uh, what you can extract from it and take away Uh, and um, so that beauty has to do with the way things show themselves and in appreciating objects for their beauty, we're in a certain way rejoicing in them. They, they are there because they are there, and we appreciate them because they are there, and we, we're not appreciating them because they're standing in for some substitute. They are what they are. And this is very important in, in the written word. This is where I'm going to do a bit of self-advertisement because not everybody in this room has yet made the mistake of buying the book that's on sale over there. Um, some have. But this is... Um, in, in this book of stories, I, I explore various uh, uh, individuals who are in search of that thing which is missing from the world in which we are uh, namely the sense of belonging to it they know that they must belong but they can't find quite uh, the, the way of representing in their own consciousness uh, that the belonging that they're searching for so I'm exploring something which religion has in the past monopolized this sense of, of being at home in the world and showing that in the world in which we are there are many individuals who have that longing to be at home but have not achieved it. Now, I could easily have presented that as a thesis, you know, a philosophical thesis about the world in which we are now, that that it's a a search for home in the absence of home. But who would be interested in that? For me, the important thing was to write it as a story in which the way of unfolding that story, presenting it bit by bit to the reader, brings the reader emotionally into the condition of the person I'm describing, so that he is that person while he's reading, and knows that he too could be feeling that, and indeed that it does relate to something deep in him. I'm not saying that, that, that I succeed in doing that, but that's what, you know, that's what was intended. And that's a completely different exercise from giving a, 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 an intellectual account of things, giving the, the sociological thesis or the philosophical basis of it, whatever. It is presenting the, the, the subject matter, but presenting it in a way which engages the reader step by step in the unfolding narrative. And that can only succeed if it is also beautiful. 
uh, in the sense that it, 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 it must attract attention for its own sake and not for the lesson that you're supposed to be learning from it. Uh, the two consequences of thinking of beauty in that way <coughs> is that uh, ugliness has an explanation. Uh, ugliness comes about, at least in part, when we cease to think of things as having any value for their own sake, any intrinsic value. When we see, that, see everything around us just as a means to an end, as, as an instrument for some purpose of our own or other people, then inevitably it strikes us as alien. If it has no other value than an instrumental value, what is the value of the whole thing? And unless we can in encounter those, those objects, those events, those states of affairs which are valuable for their own sake, all this instrument instrumentalization of our world is to us a kind of violation of it. And a purely functional world distresses us because it excludes us. Here in this room you see many things which have no function at all, including the pictures all around the wall uh, and um, the disposition of the, uh, 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 of the walls and the floors and the ceiling and so on. But they, they, they are there because they're there. Uh, uh, but whereas in the street outside, of course, you enter a, a, a largely functional world which, from which you don't feel, to, in, in which you don't feel that you belong as an observer at all. Now, of course, there are some functional forms which are very beautiful because of their function, like the form of a horse or a beautifully uh, designed aeroplane. <coughs> and that's because the function has been successfully translated into a form and so can be treated as an end and not a means. But the purely instrumentalized world, the world that lies scattered all around the <coughs> airport of Newark, which I visited today um, it, it is an uglified world a, a famous American architect um, once said that the, the clue to the architectural design, Louis Sullivan that, that it, it is that form should follow function and that true form just expresses the function of things so that the, the architect must be guided by function in order to build the, the, the building that represents the, the, the aesthetic enterprise at its best. But actually that's the opposite of the truth. The real truth about architecture is that function follows form. If you get the form right, people will adapt the function to it. Which is why you know, a, a beautiful building therefore can change its use. All the buildings that are being built in New York at the moment, as far as I could see on our way from the airport, are not like that. They won't be able to survive the existing function. Uh, they will have to be torn down when, they, when the function has expired. Whereas a, bu a building like this, you know, someone's going to preserve it and use it for something uh, uh, until it collapses of its own accord. So that's one very important feature about beauty. Another important feature is that we, that we always return to beautiful objects. We, can, we, can ex uh, they, we can't actually exhaust them because what we appreciate them for is themselves. So we return again and again to that thing. All of you who love music know that you've heard your favorite pieces of music many times and you still have not heard them enough. You return to them again and again. It's not like your textbook of legal cases, which, which once you've conned it and learned it, you put to one side. The great poem is the one that, that bears repetition forever. And in many parts of human life, uh, we expect that as well. In, in the... The, the moral stories, the moral examples that are given to us in the Bible and elsewhere, we often describe these as beautiful. Many of the stories in the, in the Gospels are beautiful, not because uh, th th that we've uh, learned from, from them a particular moral truth, but because the moral truth shines in them in a certain way, so we can return to them 
again and again and are always inspired by them. And that is very close to uh, the experience of beauty in art. It's also close to the experience of the liturgy in, in, in a properly conducted service. Um, I somewhat agree with the, 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 what, the, what Father said about, uh, well, on behalf of uh, Peter Burnett's grandfather, uh, about the mutilation of the liturgy in recent times. And, but rit- liturgies properly understood are like this. They, they are, are repeated forever. You can't, nobody can ever be in the, set, set, in the situation of saying, okay, I've heard the Mass, and I know what it's all about, I know all the words, why do I have to read it again or sit, sit through it again or repeat those words? Obviously, that's an absurd response because repetition is what it's all about. There's a human need for repetition, which is also a need for the timeless. Things that bear repetition point to another experience of time than that which we have in our daily lives. In our daily lives, event, moments follow each other, one after another, and each, each moment extinguishes its predecessor, and nothing uh, endures. But when we encounter things like the liturgy or the great poem, repetition becomes the meaning of it. You repeat it forever because this is your way of stepping outside that ordinary experience of time into a conception of the timeless. And I think we're living in a world where that sense of the timeless is being increasingly eroded. We live in a world of ephemera. Uh, the, the selfie, for instance, the, the, which is a kind of immortalization of, of, of the meaningless moment. Uh, uh, is, uh, is taking over from the great art of portrait painting, which is the, the opposite of that. The, the portrait, the true portrait, uh, um, such as the portraits that Rembrandt so br- brilliantly produced of his contemporaries in, in, in Holland of, the, of, the, of his day, in that the true portrait is not the record of an ephemeral moment. On the contrary, it's a translation of that moment into its eternal replica, into the thing that can be, uh, can be contemplated forever because it contains the meaning of that moment. And the meaning of our moments are not, is, uh, don't, don't take place in time. The meaning is something timeless. So I think this is one of the ways in which beauty uh, uh, in art and our other endeavours coincides with a, a long-standing religious need which the, which the liturgy also addresses, which is that need to step out of time into the timeless. But in ordinary everyday life, there's also another use of beauty, in the ornamenting of things, making objects into, into something more human than they would otherwise be. We, human beings exist in the world as objects among others. But we're not just objects, we're also subjects. We have the consciousness of, of, our, of our being and our, surrounding, uh, our surroundings through which we uh, have a sense of the, of the purpose of our own existence. And, and when we encounter objects, we, we transfer to those objects that sense of subjectivity. Our objects, the objects with which we surround ourselves, tend to look back at us with the same uh, subjectivity that we look on them. And everyday life is like that. This is how people create a home. They don't fill it, fill, fill it full of gad- useful gadgets, or they may do, but if you do surround yourself with merely useful gadgets, you're not going to be at home among them. A real home is something like this club, surrounded where you're surrounded by useless things. But things whose uselessness looks back on you with the same kind of subjectivity as you look on them. And and that is, again, a a deep feeling in human beings, that need to be at home in the world, to belong to things, to be part of uh, the everyday conduct, uh, of um, everyday arrangement, rather, of things around you. And I think there's no clearer proof of this than the cities that we've inherited from former civilizations, which 
are the, you know, the, the, the targets of all our tourism, where we gaze with wonder on the way in which every nook and cranny is embellished with ornament and fitted to its neighbour. You're then presented with this overwhelming sense of a community united in the determination to be. And buildings then stand side by side in full acknowledgement of each other's right. And space is something shared. And this is again something which I, I think everybody would recognise if they visit Venice. Venice is full of grand palaces, contains the greatest interior of any building anywhere, the golden tent of St. Mark's Basilica. But that's not what most inspires the visitor. Much more astonishing than St. Mark's and all the other great monuments are, are, are more touching than the Ducal Palace are these ordinary doorways on the backwater canals, those little marble-lipped bridges, shrines and niches that punctuate the walls. It's, you have a sense that all about you there's a meticulous but effortless aesthetic order in which all the residents have willingly collaborated over centuries. Uh, and the result of this is that their city, which was, as you know, planted against the odds in the swamps of the Adriatic, is the greatest shared space that's ever been made that kept itself in being you know, for a thousand years. Uh, there's not a wall or a doorway or a window frame that hasn't, hasn't been furnished in a spirit of love and adjusted to its neighbours so, it's, so as to express the power and the grandeur of the would-be resident. So things that built in Venice were all built for others, for how they look to the neighbour and to it, assert yourself side by side with the neighbour and perhaps a little bit over and above him as well. Uh, uh, and those people, uh, uh, those residents are immortalised in, in the architecture of their city. Uh, and the buildings that result are not great works of art. They're just ordinary buildings. Uh, but they fit together in this harmonious web uh, and the people fit to them as well, making a background uh, to human life. And that's, so that tiny city, scarcely bigger than Greenwich Village, which is the, the, the most acceptable part of New York, obviously, uh, has, uh, apart from the people who live there, uh, has, uh, the, it has throughout its history sustained every imaginable kind of, of voluntary association, all those squirrely uh, and, and, uh, and schools, and the c c comedies, the masked balls, and, and so on. It has existed in a continuous state of peaceful revelry and lawful self-government for a thousand years. Uh, and why did it do that? that uh, you know, how was it able to defend itself? Because the people loved it and were prepared to sacrifice themselves in its defence until the first idea of a European Union was imposed upon it by Napoleon. Um, <coughs> You know, so when we've had to live with the consequences of the subsequent attempts to unify the continent. Uh, uh, now, I realise I haven't got a great deal of time, but I, I should end by saying a few things about ugliness. Because uh, uh, this everyday beauty that, to, to me, is um, typified by, by Venice is a rare achievement. And it shouldn't be a rare achievement because there it was simply the byproduct of what ordinary people naturally are inspired to do. But somehow our world, the world in which we live, has become increasingly uglified. And I think everybody recognises that. Is it simply because people have lost the art of building properly, the art of making the right kind of music? Um, uh, you know, uh, or, or is there some deeper source of this. And I think this, is, this connects with obviously what the Weathersfield uh, Foundation is aiming to explore. The way in which the uglification of things perhaps has a deeper spiritual cause. And I think that that, that must be true. It, it must be true that, that we have lost something deep in ourselves, or at least 
have lost contact with that deep thing in ourselves, uh, uh, which makes it so easy to drift in the way that we're drifting now. On the way from from the uh, large-scale disorder of Newark, we were treated to the small-scale disorder of hip-hop in the in the taxi in the uh, in the limousine, which was very interesting to me because the the driver had a, a, a machine in his panel which told me exactly who the criminals were who were producing <laughs> this noise. And I was able to make, keep a record of what I need to speak to students about. But um, the obvious, uh, what, what was ob- most obvious about this was that this was a rep- repetitive, obsessive, and machine-mad rhythm, uh, uh, w- uh, which was, re- re- sorry, machine-made rhythm. There was hardly a, a human input into it. Buttons on a machine are, placed, are, pl- are pressed to produce those bass notes, and not in, not produced in any any instrument that a human being could play, and so on, and the, and so far have people lost the art of melody that speaking ac- over it in a kind of sh- machine gun ra- rattle of partly rhymed prose uh, is all that can be done by way of humanising the uh, the noise, and I think most you know to a musical person this is. Uh, this is agony. Um, but hum- musical people are in such short supply that they can never uh, combine in the strength needed to protest against it. And, uh, and you know, that was one of the uh, experiences which uh, made me feel you know, that, that ugliness is, is always going to be there. It glares back at you, of course, in the, in the backlit colours of advertisement, advertisements in the come hitherish figures that capture the eye, so you're constantly uh, distracting you from any serious thought towards the attractive uh, two-dimensional woman on the screen, uh, and all the, the clichés which uh, fill up the space reserved for thought. Now, uh, and all these we're familiar with, and, and it's to, just to harp on about it is of no help. But I, I think one has to recognise that these uh, distractions are assaults on something. They're assaults on the outgoing, the other-embracing nature of people. They encourage us to enter life as predators and and even perhaps as animals rather than as appreciators of others. And and just to move to one small side from the Catholic um, tradition for a moment, the... The um, condemnation of idolatry that Muhammad uh, uh, bequeathed to us has something very important uh, for us to learn from. He, he dismissed all image making as a, a, an attack on on, on uh, God's on uh, the, the fact that God is not presentable and not knowable as a sensory object, and that all I'd, uh, all interest in images is, is distracting us from the, what we should seriously be trying to understand, which is the, the underlying unity of everything. And uh, that conception, I think, has something to be said for it. We, have been, we live in a society which is completely saturated with images and saturated with distractions, which direct our thoughts away from from any kind of genuine interpersonal relation towards, uh, towards fantasies, fantasies of uh, n- not necessarily sexual fantasies, fantasies of buying this, acquiring that, uh, becoming uh, uh, empowered in this way or that or, or, or this other way through uh, uh, acquisition of things. Uh, uh, and in particular, the obsession with the human form in its represented in its represented images is something which I think uh, was uh, being warned against by by Muhammad. Uh, uh, and Muslims are very aware that this is something that that our civilization has has fallen for. We've fallen for representation as the uh, a substitute for genuine relations with people. 
And I think when people get into this, are fully saturated with the advertising culture and this mechanical version of music and all the ways in which we distract ourselves from thinking seriously about our situation as embodied beings. When we think about that, we tend to be to go to accept what people have said about art in our time, that art is simply a way of producing these attractive objects. It is simply a form of distraction, that it doesn't have any meaning apart from producing exciting images and stimulating us to, to, to live in, in other worlds than otherwise we would live in. And I think that's the point on which I'd like to focus in conclusion, that actually real art is not like the art that we've been, that is being produced today in art schools and elsewhere. It's not simply a, a byproduct of the advertising industry. It's not there to distract us. It's not giving us uh, interesting images which have their root in, in sexual fantasy or anything like that. Real art is about producing imaginary worlds. And when we create imaginary worlds, we're freeing our consciousness from subjection to ordinary objects. Consciousness becomes in charge of objects in an imaginary world and explores its own possibilities. And the, as a result, it produces, if you like, a, a kind of reality of its own. And I think this is, if we look back over the art of our civilization, it persuades us of the reality of the imagined and how we can discipline the heart and learn the truth of our own emotions through spelling them out in stories and images which bear contemplation for their own sake, which are not just substitutes uh, for our unsatisfied feelings in this world, but uh, are leading us to some kind of moral recognition of possibilities that otherwise we would deny. And I think that's where I would like to leave the point that really there is such a thing as, uh, as true art which escapes from the mechanical and repetitious and fantasy-ridden uh, art that surrounds us today. Uh, and uh, we could regain that art if, if we could only sufficiently concentrate on how it was produced uh, and how we could produce it in our condition. So I'll, I'll leave that there, and so you can ask me questions about, about what I've said. Um, well, visual art shows people how to see, yeah. Uh, all, all art, in my view, does show us how to understand what we see and observe, uh, and um, it's, it, it's not a... There's a distinction between fantasy and reality, uh, and I think this is what I was getting at it when I, in referring to the Muslim conception of idolatry, that it's taking you away from reality, whereas real art in our tra tradition has been actually confronting you with reality and making it clear to you that, that you are part of it uh, and that you must be disciplined by it as well. Well, I think there's um, literature has never lost sight of this. You know, um, there are novelists writing today uh, who and poets who are totally in the tradition uh, of the creating imaginary worlds, which are judged for their plausibility and for their uh, and for the insight that they give us into the human condition. And novelists have never turned away from that, really. It's only, it, 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 one, one of the great tragedies that, in, that has afflicted modern art is the fact that, that um, mo modern painters and, uh, and producers of art objects that can sit in museums uh, are producing things that can be sold. 
and owned, you know, and then they have this inflated price attached to them. There's no inflated price that can be attached to a, a novel because the novel doesn't even exist in the pages in which it's written. Um, it's a mere idea, so to speak. And you can't, you can't leave a concert with a symphony in your pocket. But you, you, know, you can leave a museum or a, a, a sale, uh, you know, an auction, with a painting in your... Uh, and um, so all kinds of inflated value is attached to, to paintings which have no real meaning in themselves. Like the whole Warhol, Brillo box phenomenon dominated the art world simply for the reason that, that, that the things produced could be owned and put in museums. Princeton uh, you know, University has lots of Brillo boxes uh, scattered around its, muse uh, its museum, which, has an, which have no function except to remind the students of how stupid art pro production has become. Uh, but they don't take that lesson, unfortunately. Uh, music is a tough one, isn't it? When you, when you say you love Beethoven or Brahms or Mozart, and then you have music like Shostakovich or Prokofiev or more modern art, more modern music, and you say, so, well, I don't like that. It's, 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 it's off-putting to me. And then my son has convinced me that there's something to be gained in Shostakovich, and I'm starting to listen to that. Mm. This mechanistic, this modernistic, this overly brutish kind of issue in music, isn't that difficult to... Uh, evaluate in the same way as perhaps art or architecture, which where ugliness is probably more self-evident but music sometimes can you can start to learn something with things you didn't like. Yes. I, I, um, there's truth in that, but there's a greater... It would be wonderful if all ugliness were confined to music, because then you could avoid it. Uh, with, in, in architecture, you've got no, no choice, unfortunately. Um, but uh, I, I, there is a lot to be said about Shostakovich of the kind that you said. Um, but also, there's also something kind of heroic in it. Uh, the heroic presentation of the ugliness all around him. Um, and you and I can learn from Shostakovich's symphonies something about the deep negativity of the, of the Soviet experiment which we probably couldn't learn so easily, uh, um, and certainly non-musical people couldn't learn so easily. But it doesn't seem like beauty, so. <laughs> No, it's not beauty. Uh, or, uh, but, um, yeah, uh, uh, not all art is... is there are, there's ugliness in art, which is also not ugliness. A kind of redemption of ugliness, like Baudelaire in Les Pleurs du Mal, his, his, he sets out really to redeem the ugliness of the modern city by, by painting it in a different way so that, um, so that you sense the spiritual temptation and the, you sense both the loss and the, the hope of something else. Um, you know, I, these are d deep questions of how far you can go with that. You mentioned earlier the talk about how in this new book um, we're interested in presenting portraits as a way to um, argue for something as opposed to making philosophical arguments. In this talk as well, in your descriptions of Venice, they were really, it really appealed to a heart as opposed to being really um, philosophical. So my question to you is, you came on record as um, saying that somebody like Sartre was a model for you in how to write philosophy that was philosophy that's aesthetic and beautiful. So could you talk more about your approach to um, arguing for beauty that is beautiful? Obviously, philosophy as such does not aim at being beautiful. But Sartre has, for me anyway, set an example of somebody for whom abstract ideas of a kind which I didn't agree with, but you know, fascinating in themselves, were, as it were, prowling the world, searching for the concrete circumstances which illustrated them. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, he was able to do that because he, he wrote so beautifully. Each sentence contains both the abstract idea and the concrete image that, 
that illustrates it. And if one can write like that, you know, I'd love to write like that, so I, um, I don't say I do, but that's what I would like to do. The, uh, the way in which one can think and explain, if one can, how the depiction of the ugly can in fact be beautiful. Mm. The example classically, for instance, is the various figures and scenes in Dante's Inferno. It's obvious that some well, actually, a better example is the crucifixion. Uh, our, some of our greatest works of art in our tradition are cruci crucifixion scenes. Nobody could say that, that this event is, is anything other than ugly. Uh, and yet, the artist is Mantegna's crucifixion, for instance, which has this extraordinary serenity. He's able to, to see through it uh, exactly the spiritual meaning of it uh, and the, all that's most painful and destructive becomes just one part of the redemptive whole. And uh, Tintoretto did the same, of course, uh, famously in, in Venice. Uh, uh, and um, one contrasts that, I suppose, with Grinwald's crucifixion in which the emphasis is entirely on the tortured body, uh, and one, one does wonder there whether this isn't going in the wrong way, that the ugliness of the fact has overcome the beauty of the conclusion. Uh, um, but it is the case that, you know, because we live in a world that's so full of ugliness, we do need some way of living with it. And one, one way is to transform it through its artistic representation. And I think many 19th century novelists felt this, that if they could summarize the, the ugliness that was growing around them in beautiful prose, somehow this would redeem it. And Zola, I think, felt that. Uh, and, um, you know, I feel that sometimes, you know, that, that if, if, if it can be contained within sentences which have a real rhythm to them, uh, then it is no longer ugly. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, tragedy is like that. Shakespeare confronts some of the most hor hor horrendous features of human nature in King Lear, and yet, the, uh, yet the, the play is beautiful from beginning to end, and one is reconciled in some way. But reconciled because uh, the beauty of it uh, fills it, the, uh, fills it the, the, the situation with, with your own sympathy so that you're, you, know, you feel that the world is not lost if I can still feel sympathy to, towards something like this. Uh, no, I, I mean, it's a very hard question, this, because we all know that uh, we, we are tempted to give way to despair all the time. At least I am. Um, <laughs> and um, most people in this room, I'm sure, have felt this. But that, you know, we look for the thing that can reconcile us to the, to the to suffering and sin. And one of the things that reconciles us is art. By, show it, by showing it in such a way that it, that it evokes in us a kind of redeeming sympathy. And anyway, I, I would... I'd hope that something like that can be true.